everyone. Thank you, everyone, for talking, for coming and being the audience, for helping to volunteer. Um, this has been great. This has been an amazing conference so far for me. Um, and we're going like, to kick it, well, we're going to kick off the last session um, with lightning talks. And um, it is my pleasure, as um, you, this is the order, but uh, for talk number zero, the first one, um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you um, the United States CTO, Megan Smith. So, Thank you. Oh, let me she, I'm uh, just going to give a couple of few words, um, and it's really, it's really like very special that you're here. So thank you. It's so great to be here. Um, I, it was actually really, it's related to you, but it was so cool for me when I walked in today and I saw Malala's quote. Uh, um, just you know, as you walk in on the side, I was. Uh, it sort of relates to this thing that there's so much talent everywhere everywhere, right, that we need to unlock and we need to activate and we need to work together on. And, um, you know, when she was attacked for her amazing work and leadership and standing for all girls and boys learning, um, a bunch of us using Kickstarter and then other things kind of started to work together to support her and her father and her family as the entrepreneurs who would lead us on that topic since they had the key insights and the energy like all founders. You know, I really believe in founders, uh, founders whether they're like Clara Barton or founders like, you know, Henry Ford or, or founders like Nelson Mandela, these great leaders in their teams who come together to do the thing that they're driven to do. It's almost like it's in their DNA. They're here to do that thing. Um, and it, this relates to mapping, but I'll come back to that drive. Uh, so it was in that spirit of supporting the talent of the world and specifically supporting her that a bunch of us made something called the Malala Fund. Uh, just a couple of people working together as a flash mob on the web through an email chain that just started and got momentum. And actually the UN Foundation folks got on there and helped us out and Vital Voices and others and we were able to create that. And she was able to have then a platform for her work, her, she and her family to do the great work that they're doing. And uh, eventually got here to speak and make the speech that the quote is from and continue the momentum there. But I really believe it's in what each of us sort of bring, whether it's uh, sort of the key insights that we have and the way we collaborate together. And that's why this event, this activity, this collaboration is so extraordinary. I was really lucky. Uh, I got to work um, in Silicon Valley for a while. And m part of my time was at Google. Um, and there was a moment that the motto for Google is all the world's information useful and accessible. And we were deciding uh, about this amazing company we'd come across called Keyhole, where people had these in in insights about mapping. Um, and uh, I was talking to the head of engineering at the time and said, yeah, this is all the world's information useful and accessible, and it's actually the world. And uh, it was a really exciting time to think about whether we could bring that team inside of the company and really fuel them. The, the mapping was only available uh, for, I think it was 70 bucks uh, for a license to be able to surf around in what was then to become Google Earth. And, uh, you know, what is the, the many people doing between OpenStreetMaps and Esri? And, of course, Esri predates all this work. But to be able to bring that to people for free in whichever platforms was an honor. And I got to do the acquisition of that. And then to see what everyone started doing together, whether it was that tool of MapMaker, whether as OpenStreetMap emerged and just became the force that it is. I mean, it's so incredible to think about. We just hosted our first uh, mapping hackathon in the White House. Um, but the, the work that everyone did together, yes, cool. amazing. The, the focus of the hackathon was on MapGiv, on uh, power grids, and on one other thing. I'll think about it in a sec. Um, but the, the Nepal work that you all, that everyone did together, was so extraordinary. And I think it's in the first 48 hours after the earthquake, we collaboratively, globally mapped, I think it's 20,000 or 40,000 kilometers of roads and 150,000 buildings, which caused just an extraordinary um, wave of ability for the responders to do their thing. And we'll just lift that country. Um, we did a lot of that same work for, for Western Africa uh, as the Ebola crisis was there, et cetera. So, I just, it's an incredible thing when we collaborate at this elite level. We've been, 
I've just come to the White House from the sort of this techie thing, and uh, it's an interesting thing to work in this incredibly diverse cross-functional team that has had less tech and science at all the tables. Of course, tech and science for the US government is at the NASA tables and NSF and US Geological Survey and those places, but it's not always in the more rare places where more of the poverty discussions and that go on for the US uh, work. And so to bring technology in and also crowd behavior, which is what we're all doing, to crowd innovation into those circles where the, our hardest challenges exist has been some of the greatest work I think we've been able to do, whether it's uh, teammates working on rural child poverty or teammates working on clean water and bringing the techies and these tools and these platforms that we all are fluent in uh, to those conversations, like showing up where we're more rare. I think is critically important and bringing these here. So I'm so happy that you guys came together. I think as it was, you said 41 countries or for, over 40 countries are represented by all of you, and everyone in each seat represents you know thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people sitting kind of from your same vantage point, your same country, out in the world participating too. So. Thank you for being here, and we're going to hear extraordinary lightning talks, which is one of my favorite things that we do in the world, when you hear these fast pitches from our colleagues about something that they're obsessed and passionate about. You know, founders do things, and founding teams do things, and if each of us takes something we're really, really obsessed with solving, and the rest of us help that person, we can solve a lot of things in this world. So thank you guys for being here. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good. So then we're going to kick it off. Um, Alex? Oh, Brian, sorry. Um, who, who are we? So five minutes. Are you ready? I'm ready. Well, um, the slides aren't up. But... Okay, go. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Test one, two. So um, my name is Brian Housel, and uh, I'm going to give you the state of the ID editor. Um, and I'm going to just stay here for a minute. Sure. Start it off. So, um, hey, um, I've only been doing this for maybe the last year or so, and uh, so I'm very new to OpenStreetMap. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. I kind of got started in this just because I kind of run these ridiculous races out in the middle of the woods, um, like this dirty German 50K. And uh, <laughs> so when you, when you use like Garmin Connect and Strava and all these like exercise apps, you know that OpenStreetMap is, is where all the good trails are because, you know, Google and Bing and, you know, all these other services, they just don't go out into the middle of the woods. So, uh, you know, crazies like me, we, uh, we get excited about this, and, and that's how I kind of got started, by mapping trails and tracks, and then I got in mapping my neighborhood, and one day I asked myself, well, you know, maybe I should commit some code. I'm, I'm, I call myself a developer, and uh, so I uh, took a look at the ID editor, and, you know, I just sort of, like, fell in love with it, and uh, that's what I've been doing for the last year. So uh, in ultra marathoning and in OpenStreetMap, we have this idea uh, that you can apply to both things, relentless forward progress. And, uh, you know, you just keep taking little steps one at a time and you'll eventually get to where you're going. Um, so here's the relentless forward progress that we've been making in the ID editor over the last year. You know, we're up to uh, version 1.7.2 and uh, it just keeps going forward and forward. Um, Who's using ID? Like a lot of people are using it. We have this user, uh, Imbri Samu. Uh, I don't know who that is, but he produced a set of statistics for the first two weeks in May. You can see that 68% of the change that's being made to OpenStreetMap now are coming through ID, which is pretty exciting. 58% of the unique users. Um, and all this is being done in 64 different languages. So, you know, congratulations, OpenStreetMap. Like, this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> and it's all going through ID. Um, you know, in the last year, I took a look. We're, we're adding presets all the time. So presets are, uh, you know, this is how users interface with OpenStreetMap, so they don't have to know what the tags are. And, uh, you know, as the map evolves, uh, whatever, whatever people are interested in mapping, we try to add a preset for it. And so this is just a short list, and, you know, there's more than this. Let's get into um, the features. Uh, Mapillary integration is a big one, you know. Over the last year, we've been working with Mapillary, and uh, they've, you know, now you can actually see the points where the photos are taken. You can work on your edits that way. Um, feature filtering is another big one that we put in last year. I was just talking to you at lunch, you know, and uh, it, this is one that a lot of people are using because some of these dense areas like New York City and D.C. and, you know, Paris and Germany and, you know, big cities, you, we just can't show all 5,000 of the buildings that you would be seeing in this view. So while ID has always historically like hidden some of this stuff, now we like make it a little more obvious what it's doing. 
And we've added this map data panel so that people can actually disable certain things because it's just the, the view gets too overwhelming because the map is just getting very dense. So uh, that's one exciting feature. Copy paste is pretty cool. We added this, you know, a few months ago. I mean, the architect who designed these obviously copy pasted them, and so why can't we, you know? <laughs> Conflict resolution is, is one I'm super excited to be talking about. You know, conflict resolution at the United Nations, right? Um, you know, we actually check all of uh, your edits before they go into the database against the version that's there. And, uh, you know, we check and see if, if there's going to be conflict and we let you actually see the difference between yours and theirs and, and make a decision on that, which is pretty cool. Um, smarter way dragging. So this, what you see here, the, the zigzags, we don't do that anymore. The ways just sort of slide even, you know, pretty nicely along. And then this little mini-map thing, it's almost like playing like a game like Civilization, right? Where you can like go up there and you can kind of scroll and zoom and pan and it'll take you um, to where you need to be. Um, the last minute or so, I uh, <laughs> have no more last minute, but you know, I just wanted to say thank you. So uh, seriously, they help us, you know, this is our GitHub, check us out. And uh, you know, I hope that we could get some more people hacking on ID in the next year. Thanks. Great. Diana? Hello. I'm Diana. I started at Mapsen about five months ago, and that was also my introduction to the geo world, whereas before I had never touched OSM or um, any really, like I haven't worked with maps. Um, I'm a software engineer for 15 years, so that's my background. Um, and so my first project when I started um, was to look into the quality of the administrative boundaries data in OSM, which I thought was interesting. And I had, because I had never seen the planet file I downloaded, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go look at this data. I was like, oh, wait, there's so much other data. How do I figure out what I'm looking at? Um, and so we all know that OSM is massively, unapologetically, hugely awesome. And we all want this. Everybody's here because we want to encourage more edits to the data. Um, but as it continues to grow, we consequently have less and less idea of what's actually in there. Um, it's really hard to gauge the quality of any one subset of data, like the admin uh, boundaries. And so um, it becomes more and more important to separate that data out. Um, a lot of times I feel like the OSM community, you know, we want all these edits and it kind of reminds me of the uh, underpants gnomes, if anyone's familiar with this reference. Um, but, you know, we want all of the data. We want to collect it. We want to, we don't, you know, we don't have step two yet, but like we know that at the end when we collect all this data, it's going to be amazing and everyone's going to win, right? Um, but we have to figure out what to do in the interim until it becomes awesome. And so, what I would propose in the interim is that we do the four I's. We identify these interesting subsets of data, we isolate them, we inspect them, and then we improve them, which feeds the data back into OSM. Um, and so what we've done with the administrative boundaries, we called it borders, fences, borders, kind of the same thing. Um, basically, we've identified that data set, and we've identified it as anything that's tagged with boundary administrative and admin level not null. and we isolated that data, we've extracted it, basically constructed the polygons using Osmium, created GeoJSON files, um, one per admin level, and we've made them available for download on the MapZen website so that anyone can go and grab these GeoJSON files. We've created the planet extract and we also have the country subsets so that if you're only interested in your country because that's what you know well or that's what your use case entails, um, then you can grab that. And like I said, it's hosted at mapzen.com data borders. Um, and so the next step is to inspect this data. And we've included the errors JSON file that was generated during the extraction process. And there are errors, there are missing nodes um, in ways. So we hope that the community looks at those errors and goes back into the data set and fixes it in OSM. So the next time you run the extract, um, it gets picked up. We want to visualize this data. So the next step is also to create tools that will help us put these things on the map in an automated way. And so you could take a country and say, I want to see all the different layers. I want to see them on a the map. And I want to see holes in the map. And then I'm going to go fill those holes in. Um, or you could see where the data is sparse. So also, as people start using the data, they're going to notice that there are errors in it, if there are, um, and where things are missing. And it's going to generate discussion around the shortcomings of the data. 
This is just an image of the um, USA data, and you could see that it's like really dense on the east side and like relatively sparse on the west. Um, and so just visualizing it like this and having it isolated will help people um, drive to fix the data. And again, improve it once you've realized what you, what's missing. Fix the errors, fill in the gaps, um, keep track of the progress. As we isolate this data set, we can also keep track of how many edits were made specifically in that subset of data, as opposed to overall in OSM, because it's so large, um, that's hard to do. And then, because we're going to monthly build these extracts, um, they're gonna be, they're gonna stay fresh, and any edits that you guys make um, or the community makes into OSM will get picked up and um, keep improving this data set. And we also are open source, so if you guys have any contributions to the source code, the tools have been made available on our GitHub. So you can also create your own extracts and um, add regions that aren't necessarily in there now. Um, so we welcome all of the community to contribute back. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Eleanor Davis. I'm a senior, senior environmental studies major at George Washington University. I'm also the president of our Humanitarian Mapping Society, which is a group of students that goes out, um, asks for, uh, Red Cross, USAID, what do you need? And then at our mapathons that happen every semester and at our meetings, we actually do what they ask. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about a specific project that we have, uh, mapping for youth empowerment and community development. So uh, this is our team. I'm the team lead, and then Arzu Malhorta and Marietta Gelfort, who's out in the audience, um, is our other team members. So the location of our project is in Washington, D.C., specifically in the Washington Highlands region of Ward 8. We chose this area because, it's, because of the high childhood poverty, the high unemployment rate, and it's also considered a, a food desert. We're hoping that from this project, we'll be able to identify future projects that could happen within the community for development. We're also hoping to empower the students uh, through this project so that they, they can take that into high school and then also into college. So what are we actually doing? First, we're educating students about the environmental and social issues and strengths in their community. We're also going to be teaching them how to use open source mapping and uh, from that, we're hoping that they are empowered to continue using open source, teaching their families, their communities, their teachers how to use this, and creating new projects from that. So who are we actually working with? We're working with Higher Achievement, which is a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., that runs a program from fifth through eighth grade that helps to teach the uh, students more about um, math, science, geography, uh, English, and helps them transition into high school. We're specifically working with a group of 27th and 8th grade students that have been in, this pro uh, been in this program since fifth grade. We're also very grateful for a grant from the Eco Equity Challenge, which was sponsored by Siemens and uh, coordinated by the GW Office of Sustainability and the GW Office of Civic Engagement and Public Service. We're also very grateful to our uh, um, to the people, uh, to our advisors, uh, Stephen Johnson and um, Nula Cohen. So we're beginning this project pretty soon. It's a, uh, the summer session is six weeks long. We'll be spending three days a week with the students where they'll actually be going outside in the field and mapping specific topics that we've identified. They'll be, uh, their topics are food and green spaces stormwater, and emergency management such as uh, fire hydrants and streetlights. They'll be doing this through three different platforms, uh, OpenStreetMap, um, field papers, which they'll actually be creating, and uh, Mapillary so that they can um, go back and look at what they've mapped just to um, look back th during analysis. 
The second part of the project will be during the school year. We'll be spending approximately 30 weeks with the students uh, where they'll actually be analyzing the data that they've collected during the summer and then creating final presentations where they report the results and hopefully identify projects that will happen in the future. They'll be, rep they'll be presenting these uh, projects then to the GW and DC officials that will come to them. So finally, please feel free to contact us. We are looking for speakers to come talk to the students about their experiences in the open source world. And we're also very open to suggestions about better ways to uh, teach the students and uh, create and do this project. We also have a Twitter and blog where the students will be routinely uh, posting about their experiences, posting um, their uh, progress in their projects, and we'll also be posting any materials that we use and any presentations that we give during that time. So thank you very much. We were really impressed with uh, that we're keeping the five minutes. Like, no pressure. No pressure, okay. Andrew. Yeah. Hello. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about uh, geography in uh, American academia and universities. Um, so first, I just want to get an idea of who I'm talking to. So um, raise your hand if you majored or are majoring in or teach geography at a university. Awesome. I bet that is statistically different than the rest of the population, <laughs> um, which I think is a problem. Um, so I want to start with a little bit of the history. Um, and for those of you who raised your hands, this might be um, repeating something you learned in college, so forgive me. Um, so the history of geography in American academia begins at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it never really got a great foothold. Um, it was kind of stuck somewhere between the soft sciences and the hard sciences. And things came to a head in 1948 when Harvard uh, cut their geography program. Uh, the president of Harvard at the time said that it was unworthy of study at the university level. Um, and that set off a domino effect. Um, I believe all of the Ivies closed their programs, um, several large uh, major public institutions. And um, geography was left uh, to the hands of smaller, lesser known schools, um, where it has remained. Um, so, sorry. Um, and to this day, I know, I know. Um, and so to this day, geography struggles to maintain a foothold uh, in academic departments around the country. Um, and then fast forward to the end of the 20th century and the arrival of GIS, which was great um, because the geography departments were given something to rally around and uh, gave them an identity, um, which is good. It's been brought more to the forefront. Um, the numbers uh, of people enrolled in undergraduate geography programs have been increasing steadily. Um, but I think there's still a crucial problem, um, and that is that largely in undergraduate geography programs, uh, the GIS component has focused on the elephant in the room, which is ArcGIS. And I think that is a problem, um, because ArcGIS is great and useful, but I think that OpenStreetMap should be the core component of GIS education in American universities. Because, thank you, that's awesome. Um, now, uh, the reason for this are, are several, uh, because uh, OpenStreetMap is not a tool, and ArcGIS is a tool, and it's a great tool. But teaching geography majors how to use a tool for four years, and you can look, um, Google uh, Intro to GIS Syllabus, and just look at what you find. It's amazing, actually. If you look at the semesters that are being laid out in colleges around the country, it is literally just focused on one product. And I think that teaching geography majors only to use ArcGIS is akin to teaching writing majors only to use Microsoft Word. Um, so uh, with that, I, I call on geography professors and departments to teach their students how to use Mapbox, to use Maps then to use the humanitarian uh, data. All of these um, organizations that are here uh, that are sponsoring this event are fantastic tools. And our geography majors should be equipped to use them after they leave their degree programs. 
Um, I think I think that's everything. And I will uh, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. It sizzles a little bit because I use Esri every day. I think it's on uh, GitHub. I can give you the URL if it's. All right, um, my name is Christopher, and I'm a developer at GIS Inc. Indoors, and I'm here to talk with you about pedestrian routing. Um, bear in mind, when I kind of submitted this talk, um, it was like three months ago, and um, everything's kind of changed in routing in uh, OpenStreetMap within that time. So just keep that in mind. All right, so show of hands, how many of you take your car to work every day? Okay, so th this being New York, you probably all take public transportation, maybe? Okay, maybe a bicycle? But I can almost guarantee all of you use some form of pedestrian transportation, you know, to get from your car to the office, to get from the bus to your home, uh, to get from your bicycle from the city bike station to the grocery store. Um, so we use pedestrian networks like every day, multiple times a day, but they're also like the most underutilized, like underdeveloped data source um, in GIS. Like most city departments, they don't build it because you know there hasn't been a use. Um, it's very difficult. You need a lot of information, and you know that it's just incredibly difficult. And you might be thinking like, oh, but Google, you know, all these other services, they have pedestrian routing. And that's cool and all, but they don't really have the high granularity that, you know, an uh, uh, open street by that we can build ourselves. Like, they don't know about that little cut through, through your backyard to get to the, the major hiking trail. Um, they don't support dis um, people with disabilities by um, having restrictions that allow only people, with, you know, allowing people with uh, wheelchair access. These are things that are just not available in any of these services. But that's something that we can do in OpenStreetMap. We have the breadth of like, you know, the entire world working on this one map. And we are like everywhere. We're like, you see all these people surveying around, like they've got their notebooks and they can go down the street and say, oh, this is, you know, wheelchair accessible. Um, this is a path that anybody can take. So I work for uh, JSON Indoors and I work on a product that does uh, Geometry Navigator. I work on college campuses. Um, showing people how to get from their classroom to the dining hall, stuff like that. And it's pretty sweet. Um, but after last year's State of the Map, I got really excited um, seeing a lot of the stuff about people using routing uh, in OpenStreetMap. And I was like, how can I take all this information that's in my head? Like, I think about, like, up here, I was like, man, how would I model this? This is crazy. You know? Like, this is, like, stuff that's in my head all the time. And I was like, how can I do this in OpenStreetMap? So I just want to talk about, like, how you guys can edit your data a little bit to make it a lot easier for me to like use your data. Um, how uh, Mapbox, Mapsin, can you make like all these like really cool navigation apps? Because uh, it's all about data. Um, first, I prefer having sidewalks as their own line just because I think it makes more logical sense. Um, also trails, stuff like that. You should be using footway. Um, a lot of people put it as pedestrian, but actually that's incorrect according to the wiki. And I don't know why it's called pedestrian. It drives me crazy. Um, but pedestrians are technically those like roads that are closed off to traffic, but only for people, which is really weird. Um, so use footway. Um, you can also put sidewalk tags on stuff, um, like any highway will make it technically a pedestrian route. Um, when you're drawing stuff, you want to make sure it doesn't really show up very well. But you want to make sure there's a little dot where two lines intersect. Uh, if they don't have that dot, it means it's kind of treated like a bridge where it's going up and over. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so access, we want to make sure that uh, 
If it's publicly accessible, you want to make this yes. If it's private, no. And if it's kind of discouraged, like you get awkward looks when you walk through their yard, <laughs> you want to make it discouraged. And finally, wheelchair accessibility. If it has a ramp, it needs to be less than five degrees. Uh, if it needs to be pretty smooth, like you know, a wheelchair can go over it. And the width can, you know, you want to make it at least a couple meters wide. And if that, all those things are true, then it's safe to assume it's wheelchair accessible. And in no time, you'll be making sweet pedestrian routes in OpenStreetMap.org. So if you have any questions, you just want to talk shop. Um, I have a GitHub repo, and I've been kind of editing it off and on for like a year, um, using PG routing, which is a lot of fun because it does 3D. Um, which I don't think any of the other services do. So please reach out to me over a beer tonight. Thank you. Uh, this is a GeoNYC representative. Um, for people coming to GeoNYC, we have a, 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 a picture here uh, right after these Hi, talks. Party. Yeah, I mean, just saying, not that I'm taking away his time or anything. He's like, oh. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeff Rizzoco, and I'm going to talk to you about a little project I'm doing called Outgoing NYC. It's uh, the hidden history of the hidden geography of NYC's gain of life. What are you doing? Um, <laughs> so it's what I'm making is a map, a spatial representation of uh, documented LGBT nightlife spots in New York City uh, and possibly beyond. Uh, so you can see it at outgoingnyc.com. Uh, the goal is to compare NYC LGBT neighborhoods now and then. Uh, here are three, actually that good, looks good blasted out, uh, 1960, the middle one's 1980, and the other one is 2015, so you can see some density changes. 1960, there were not very many bars because we couldn't be out in public. In 1980, we were out everywhere partying, and now it's getting a little weird, so we're going to talk about that. <laughs> So this is a gay neighborhood is a neighborhood where LGBT people could safely gather, reducing risk and harm or judgment, and thereby creating a social center. This is a real picture of a, a gay neighborhood. No, it's The Simpsons. <laughs> In New York, there, uh, Christopher Street is sort of the core. San Francisco, the Castro, and um, LA, West Hollywood. Uh, and many are wondering what's going on next with the gay neighborhoods in New York City. Uh, these are some c candidates, but they're not really well, we don't know. So the bigger question is whether, whether there will ever be another gay neighborhood in New York City at all and what it will look like in 20 years. Because cities are changing, they're becoming more expensive and developing faster. Gays are integrating socially because we now have uh, acceptance and we can be out at work and that sort of thing. And then dating and hookup apps are just taking over our bars, but we're working on that. So what we need is data. Um, how many bars, clubs, bathhouses are there now, and how does that compare to the 70s, 80s, and 60s? Uh, what are the qualities of bars we need to know? Uh, and what is the interaction between the virtual and physical, say, grinder and um, splash, or whatever. Not splash, but whatever. Um, so here's my husband taking the whole thing. He'd like <laughs> <laughs> He's really cynical. And um, so what I did is I started scraping old texts that were written about gay history, specifically about New York. You know, a lot is written about gay history in New York, and so I, I've, we've, my husband and I have both been reading these books and scraping locations that they talk about. Um, also crowdsourcing from people at the site itself and talking to people uh, in, in bars. Old gay men are awesome to talk to. Uh, and then, of course, the gay guides. Every time you went to a, a city and you were gay in, say, the 50s, 60s, actually 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and, and still, um, you, were, you could find a guy that told you where it was safe to go and you wouldn't get killed. Uh, and so we've been pulling those. Anthony DiDonaro, where are you? Uh, scraped hundreds of these for me. And uh, we're continuing to do that through the New York Public Library and the LGBT Archive, uh, the center here. Um, on the map now, there are locations only after dark. Um, before dark will come later. Um, Mars, bars, uh, clubs, bathhouses, cruising areas, shops that support nightlife, after hours restaurants, and night use cafes. And then events that are sort, sort of culturally significant, like big parties that made a big difference. Thank you. Um, and then therefore you get a picture of our history, uh, just sort of like what it might have looked like at any one time. There's a great slider I just put up two days ago that you can kind of look at individual years. Um, and a lot of the dates are approximate because there aren't good records, so I'm working on that. Why would I do this? Uh, when we need to uh, document our after-hours history because it's been a big part of our life. Uh, there was a sit-in at Julius that made a big difference, Stonewall riots, and then the Saint uh, and St. Mark's Baths both were the first gay-owned businesses not owned by the Mafia. Um, uh, I'm still investigating if that's really exactly true, but 
Uh, then just last week, Stonewall Inn was um, up for landmarking, which I don't know why that didn't happen about 10 years ago, but it's, it's now happening. Uh, and then uh, I want this map to foster intergenerational interaction. If you're under 30, you should find someone that's gay over 50 and talk to them about what they experienced right now. This is Wallace. He was a huge inspiration for this project because he kept telling me about bars in East Village that I didn't know about, and I just started writing them down, and we still talk about it like all the time. Uh, and then finally, dating and hookup apps um, are changing the bars in modern times. I'm talking to a lot of people about how to make that different. And upgrades coming are more cities. San Francisco, you're on the list. Uh, community boards in New York, I want to figure out why they're turning bars down. Uh, and discussion forums, stories, images, and integration possibly with open historic map. Uh, and um, the New York Public Library, I'm coming to talk to you next week. And so if you want to see it, come to outgoingnyc.com. We have a GoFundMe to help get some of the research done and the travel for it. Uh, we have other cities coming, maybe Atlanta and Chicago seem good. Uh, and then follow us on Twitter. I'm Zingbot on Twitter, so if you follow me too. Great, thanks. Thank you. Other GOMIC person? So no? Take it away. Huh? What? Uh, oh. Go. Uh, go. Uh, I'm going to say cat. You're going to say mapper. Cat. Come on, louder. Cat. All right, thanks. I'm glad to see all of you participating. Um, so, um, this is a participatory conference. Uh, have I started? Is my timing going yet? Oh, it, it's going, right? Boom. Ouch. Uh, so, mapping is hacking. I'm no neck of Beta NYC. So, some of you may not know what a civic hacker is. It's anyone who's willing to collaborate with others as they address challenges relevant to their neighborhood and neighbors. Guess what? You're all civic hackers. Today's National Day is Civic Hacking. I'm glad to be here and find all of you. I almost feel like I shouldn't be. Can you? Is this thing even working? Uh, it's a prop. Um, maybe I'll do this one. Ooh, yeah. How about that? Is that even better? Um, so, um, uh, 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 huh? It doesn't work for the video recording. Oh, I have to do this. Um, so everyone carries a piece of the puzzle. Nobody comes into your life by mere coincidence. Trust your instincts and. Do the unexpected, find your others. Did you think that you'd hear about Timothy Leary today? Uh, when I first came to this community, uh, I realized that I had truly found my others. I was that nerd Puerto Rican Mormon growing up in Dayton, Ohio, who couldn't find anybody else. Uh, and then I moved to New York City and I found all you interesting nerds. So this is a little story about how we found each other. So back in 2004, New York City was pioneering. Before Amazon, before Google Maps, New York City put out a base map that, you, that was accessible via the web, which is amazing. So this was launched in 2004. That same year, New York City's, uh, one of New York City's greatest advocacy organizations, Transportation Alternatives, Launch crash that. They were using the Freedom of Information Act to get state data so that way they could then map where those dangerous intersections were happening, right? So this is all before Amazon Web Services. Sorry, Jed. Um, so in 2008, we were able to use Amazon Web Services and build an even cooler map where we were able to document election protection issues. This stemmed from a blog post. It grew to an email list. That email list then turned into an actual uh, a code repository. This is before GitHub, too. Um, and so uh, we finally were able to build all the bits and pieces, and we were able to uh, help protect uh, election issues. This got turned into Yushihidi. So through that action, New York City's part of New York City's civic tech community was born. It was built on the shoulders of great organizations like Gizmo, who have been fighting uh, for the last 25 years here in New York City for great GIS data. Now the state of New York City's data is woo -woo. Um, So uh, this is uh, Community Board 6. This, uh, this Community Board represents the UN. These are 311 issues in their, uh, on their public website. Every single month when they go and talk about the problems in the community, they're using 311 data. Set, uh, and so, um, next one. Uh, we've been starting to use through in one data and build this tool called Citygram. This is an open source code base where you can be taking notification data and turn it into real time actionable data. So here, uh, with um, with this code base, we've got three on one. We've got vehicle collisions. Uh, there's teams in other cities that are being coordinated out of uh, one of the Carolinas. So take a look at it, repurpose it, 
make data even more useful. Um, some other cool tools that are happening here in New York City because of some crazy open data uh, is reevaluate. Uh, imagine Craigslist on steroids with actual uh, uh, total scores and, and um, uh, points and evaluation data uh, so that way you can see whether or not how many rats uh, are in the building, how many times that the landlord uh, has violated uh, your uh, rights or other people's rights. Um, so Mind My Business, which is one of the coolest apps, mapping apps that I've seen lately, um, it's it really designed for storefronters. Storefronters are people who own storefronts or operate storefronts, and it pushes data to them. It pushes open data to them. All right, so how does this kind of work into this great, uh, illustrious uh, lightning talk? So focus on things that matter. Fix things that matter. Code for America. If you're interested in doing a fellowship and trying to fix government, go and apply for Code for America. Fellowship. It's a one-year opportunity. There's a number of fellows out here. It's a great, great opportunity to reinvent government for the 21st century. Second thing, you can come join us here in New York City. There's GONYC, which is great. They meet monthly. We meet weekly. We love to collaborate. We want to hang out. We're all here together. You are our others. Um, we have an online forum, talk.beta.nyc, and then there's data.beta.nyc, which is our community data collaboration website. So share it. Love it. Thank you. Great. Eric? Uh, final G O N Y C. Oh yes. Awesome. I was really excited to see all of the hands that were raised when um I forget your name. Chris asked um, how many people bike to work. That's really exciting, uh, because I'm going to be talking about updating New York City's bike lane data in OSM. Uh, so as you may or may not know, New York City has a pretty extensive bike lane network. Mostly, we interact with it through this paper map that is given away for free. Um, the data in OpenStreetMap hasn't been updated systematically kind of ever, so there are a lot of gaps in it. Uh, Colin Riley, late last year, suggested that um, maybe we should update that data with the most recent shapefiles. So we decided to do that. These are kind of the steps. Uh, get the data, compare the data, um, upload the missing bike lanes to map, map Roulette, and map it. So we got the data. It looked like this much easier to work with than the paper data. Uh, this is the official, most recent city data. And we overlaid it with OSM. You can kind of see the gaps. Um, there are the thin lines. Those are what the city has that OSM doesn't. It's actually not that much, but it's a lot of connective bits, which are important for routers. Um, this one might be really hard to see. There's a faint green line. The geometries are off sometimes, so we wanted to catch those too. Um, so once we found all the bike lanes that were not in OSM, but that the city said existed, we wanted to upload those to MapRoulette. If you've never done that before, it can be a little complicated, but these two links on these slides help a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can really say about that right now. But uh, managed to get that working. So now, um, if you're not familiar with MapRoulette, you go to this page and it gives you a random thing to work on. Thanks. Um, right now, there are 2,800 line segments that the city says are bike lanes, but are not in OSM. So you can go there right now and you can help add bike lanes to OSM. Um, I might have simplified that a bit. Bike lane mapping in OSM is pretty complicated. Uh, because there are lots of different kinds of bike lanes that I can't get into. I only have five minutes. Um, but there is an amazing OSM wiki page that's just called Bicycle. And it has all these scenarios listed out and exactly how you tag them. Um, yeah. So it's actually pretty good. Um, there are some other problems, such as does the lane belong on the street? Some people disagree about this and draw separate bike lanes alongside the street. Um, some people do not. Some people don't realize that and accidentally draw an extra bike lane. Um, 
And also, left and right in OSM isn't always obvious, unfortunately. Uh, so there's some problems to work through. It's not maybe the best task for newbies. Um, but if you're pretty familiar with it, it's not too bad. The task has only been on MapRoulette for about two weeks, and those blue lines are the new ones. So you can see there are some new bike lanes in OSM because of this. Um, I have kind of four questions. Maybe you can find me later if you have any ideas about any of these. First, how do we get others involved? Who are the biker mappers who want to help out with this? I'm not sure. So far, I think I might be the only one. Uh, what's the next challenge we should do? Um, right now, we're finding the missing bike lanes. There are probably other things we could do, um, such as uh, find the places where the tagging doesn't quite line up with what the city says the bike lane is, that sort of thing. Um, another challenge for this is um, figuring out if the cleanup actually worked. When it's something that's rendered, like a street or a building, it's really obvious when it worked or didn't. Um, when it's got to do with routing, that's not really clear. So if you have any ideas about how to tell if these changes are helping, that would be awesome to know. Also, um, is there anything that routers are looking for that we could help with that we're not currently collecting? Um, really excited that this weekend lots of people are talking about routing. So um, looking forward to continuing that conversation. And here are some links. Um, the most important one might be for the slides because it has all the links in them. Thanks. So if you attended Kerry Stokes' talk this morning, I'm the academic that walked into the bar with the bureaucrat and the developer. Um, and I work at Columbia University, one of the schools that closed down its geography department in the 1980s. So I graduated from Dartmouth, where they still have a geography department. So um, proud to say that. Um, I uh, want to just say that um, we've been working on a data set called the Global Roads Open Access Data Set, which is essentially a GIS-ready data, data layer. Um, when we started in 2007, Steve Coast was with us, and that was really when OSM was just taking off, and it was really an urban-focused kind of Europe and North American enterprise. It's grown quite a bit. Uh, but there's still questions about how complete the OSM data are in any given country. So we have decided to partner with OSM to look a little bit more carefully uh, what's going on, in, especially in least developed countries where there's a lot of interest in biodiversity conservation, climate vulnerability, development type applications, to see how complete OSM data are and whether or not they can be sort of counted on in, say, humanitarian situations. And ultimately, we'd like to assimilate some of these data into this Global Roads open access data set, which we're developing under the umbrella of an ICSU body. I ICSU is International Council for Science called CODATA. Uh, the main point of this data set is it's sort of plug-and-play, GIS-ready data for people who want to just use road, pretty, particularly settlement-to-settlement -settlement road links, and use it for modeling or research purposes. There's a lot of prior OSM validation work, so I'm not going to go through these, but just to say that we're aware that there's a lot of work that's been done, but we'd like to know about other work that may be missing from this list. Um, there, uh, we did an analysis, and I'm just going to present very briefly the results for from May 25th, 2014 to the most to May 2015. Uh, what was going on in West Africa? It's one of the lagging regions. And uh, basically, we looked at several countries. The approach we took was to do some validation on, against uh, Google Earth imagery to see how closely OSM data, sort of the georeferencing of the OSM data, important intersections. We chose a number of random tiles where there wasn't sufficiently high resolution imagery. We had to choose alternative tiles. So we ended up with this um, set of tiles here. And um, we then looked at the spatial accuracy uh, using two different metrics. One is RMSE root mean square error, which is sort of the average XY difference. 
So you can see actually OpenStreetMap data compared to Google Earth, and that's not ground truth, but it's pretty good. Uh, ground truth, um, generally Google Earth imagery is about five meters off of ground, ground truth, so it's not a bad reference point. And what you see is that for most of the countries of West Africa, we're about uh, 20 to 50 meters off of um, the sort of mean XY. In terms of road length growth, it's very interesting to see that the Ebola affected countries grew by about 240% on average uh, over this last year compared to the non Ebola affected countries, which was only about 50% growth. So uh, we, um, what that clearly shows is that if you want to increase your OSM coverage in a country, have a crisis of some sort. Um, and uh, you can see the number of edits that have occurred and also sort of the density of the Ebola affected area. This doesn't show up very well, but the darker bluish colors are the, the road links that have had the most edits. And we also can do some analyses looking at the road length increase. Unfortunately, the greatest increase has been in the un, uh, unclassified category. Uh, so there's a need for more classification. I'll summarize by saying that OSM is rapidly evolving. It's a moving target. Validation uh, at any point in time is soon going to be obsolete, especially in countries that have recently experienced a disaster like Nepal or the Ebola-affected countries. There's an absence of independent objective data in many low-income countries. There's few authoritative commercial providers, and high-resolution imagery is often patchy in sort of those publicly accessible things like Google Earth. Uh, so we need you know, better ground truth data essentially to validate against. Then as far as the assimilation goes, sometimes OSM data, they vary in terms of their detail, the road types that are used, sometimes they're very particular types of road types in different the schema that are used. Uh, ideas are welcome and I'd just like to invite you tomorrow, we're going to have a uh, birds of a feather at 2 p.m. in room C. So I invite you to come and join us to talk about some of these issues, particularly if you're interested in uh, least developed country type uh, mapping issues. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, everyone. Um, if you're from GUNYC, stay. We're going to take a picture. Otherwise, uh, there are buses that are outside on 47th and 1st that will take us over to Queens, um, where we can drink, be merry, have food, etc. cetera. Uh, so thank you for coming for the first day. Stay to the map. I hope to see you later tonight and tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>